Hello. Hello. Yeah, good evening, friends. Uh, welcome to NRS Samay. We have today with us Professor Shanta Sinha, Chairperson, National Commission for Protection of Child Rights. NCPCR has been set up in 2007. So, with Professor Shanta Sinha as its first chairperson, and they could not have chosen a better person to lead this crucial body. Uh, Dr. Sinha is a Raman Maxwell Awardee and a Padma Shri. She is an academician, a teacher, an activist, an intellectual, and a policy-making expert. As it has been seen down the years, she combines the right amount of administrative and legal acumen with remarkable sensitivity in approaching issues pertaining to children. Her pioneering work through the Mamidi Pudi Venkatranga Foundation is quite famous, and it has set an example uh, for uh, agencies across the country in dealing with the evil of child labour. Uh, Professor Sinha, welcome to NRS Samai. Uh, Thank it you. Is, it is a real honor to have you on the show. Uh, and uh, I'm sure our listeners have a lot of questions to ask you. Uh, uh, but uh, let's start with the, uh, probably, you know, could you please tell us, I mean, uh, what exactly NCPCR is, I mean, how crucial it is uh, for NCPCR. And, you know, we have been uh, observing lately that uh, you, you are uh, called upon to intervene in many situations, many kinds of problems. So right. uh, how, how crucial is NCPCR at this point in time in, in, in our country? I, uh, I must say that the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights is a yes. statutory body set up under the Act of Parliament. It yes. is as important as the National Human Rights Commission or the National Commission for Women. Uh, and uh, it is authorized to look into complaints on violations of children's rights in the country. And it has been doing, I think, uh, remarkable work on a very uh, diverse set of issues like child labor, child trafficking, malnutrition, children in areas of unrest, and, uh, the, you know, uh, right to education. Uh, we have been able to make some very important interventions in policies, in suggesting law reforms. Uh, and also in influ influencing the way in which, say, the government should look at corporal punishment. So it has a diverse range of issues that it is involved in. E yes, ma'am. So I, I think, you know, the first thing probably is on top of uh, everybody's mind now, the Haryana scenario, uh, where the carpenters have been, uh, you know, saying alarming things and uh, really even uh, shocking things have been happening there. So they that have been talking true. about the, yeah, they've been talking about lowering of marriage age. You 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 think uh, that that uh, that going that should be taken seriously? No, no. Certainly, what is happening in Haryana uh, is uh, truly very shocking and alarming. And uh, there are many reasons. One being the very issue of gender discrimination in that state, which starts with feticide and then infanticide. You have an adverse sex ratio. Some of the worst uh, districts in the country is in Haryana. In fact, now they're not having women uh, whom men can marry. So they're getting women from Kerala and Northeast yes. into Haryana. And yes. when, there are, when there's a scarcity of women, there is also a growth in domestic violence and mm. also sexual abuse and sexual violence. And that is what they're witnessing there. It is retrogressive. It is decadent. And people, I think, must transcend their pettiness and must look at girl child with dignity. And that is what we have been calling for from the government. Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So there is, a, there is a new proposal uh, which is probably one of the most outrageous suggestions that have ever been made, that the lowering of marriage age, uh, they are apparently citing some historical uh, instances of uh, early marriage. Uh, they have been talking of this. You, you, you think it is something that should be taken seriously? Uh, what no, I think it is absolutely rubbish, uh, mm. uh, and it it is barbaric the kind of suggestions that they have made, and they are actually uh, calling upon something that happened in medieval times uh, to talk about something that is uh, going on in the 21st century, and you know 21st century is informed by discourses on rights, discourses on human dignity. The discourses on uh, individual development and growth. None yes. of these were part of discourses in medieval era or by, uh, or uh, uh, pre-modern era. So yes. we will have to talk, locate girls and what we want to do with girls in the manner that it fits into a human rights discourse, which means that they cannot be child marriages. And all over the world now we are saying child marriage is a form of violation of human rights. 
You know, it can cause abuse, it can cause health issues, it can cause trauma, it can cause uh, uh, low birth weight when children are born. It, 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 it is uh, a serious violation of human rights if girls are married before uh, their marriageable age. And it yes. cannot be accepted at all. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, it has been noticed that some of, some elected representatives from Haryana have been uh, backing the Kap Panchayat stance. Uh, is there something that NCTC can do, I mean, to uh, no, probably have, control them? No, no, we have written very strong letters uh, to the government and also to the chief minister. We have, in fact, said that there has to be speedy trial, and I have seen in today's uh, press note where the chief minister did announce that there would be speedy trial. And we yes. also said that, uh, that there has to be a special court, there has to be a uh, grievance redressal mechanism somewhere where girls can go when they, are, they feel threatened. This is usually when there is a case of rape or when there is a case of violence on a child, it's not a surprise. Girls yes. do have a sense that this can happen to them, but they mm. must know where to go and whom to address and where to uh, seek shelter. And I, we, we've uh, given this as a suggestion to the government that they must have a helpline, they must have a grievance redress cell. We also, in fact, said that girls must be trained in self-defense yes, yes, yes. to resist such physical violence on them. And not to just resist physically, but we feel that if a girl is physically strong, yes. she can get the courage to say no uh, yes. uh, to, to any form of physical violence. Yes. Okay. So we have suggested even that to the government, and I hope they take them seriously. Uh, is, is there anything that NCPCR is doing uh, by directly addressing the Kap Panchayats, or, uh, or is, is, is it uh, not, not really? You know, the, I, I actually we think that we have to work with the government and uh, put pressure on the government and persuade the government. There's just no sense in talking to the uh, medieval uh, Kap Panchayats that we have. So we yeah. felt that there is, we will have to, you know, as a commission, we have to engage with the community and engage with the government and get the government to say the right thing and yeah. be firm on it. So we really do not think that the commission could, in fact, or should talk to the Kap Panchayats and we will have to talk to the government and see that they have a very strong shelter and protective net for girls and that the girls have all... Uh, right. In fact, that we also talked about their equal share in property. Yes. There are laws, but there never is a follow-up on seeing whether girls have that share in property. So, yes. you know, we are talking about many structural issues which enables girls to assert themselves. Yes. Uh, uh, the the redressal mechanism that you were talking about, about the panchayat and block and district level, yes. Uh, yes. Is, is there a proposal to have something like that across the country or... Uh, uh, have you been referring specifically to Haryana at this point? Actually, we had re referred it specifically to Haryana, but I think what you say is right. There is uh, there is a need to have it across the country on several aspects of violations of children's rights. Say, for example, on right to education. Yes. There is, uh, the Act gives so many um, guarantees and uh, they have to be complied with. And if they are not complied with, where do they go? Where, do, where does the citizen go? Where does a child go for redressal of that grievance? And there has to be a grievance redressal mechanism available from, I said, at the uh, Gram Panchayat level. Uh, it is so important to have this kind of a mechanism for almost every right that is guaranteed under the Constitution for children. Ah, yes, I'm uh, talking of violation of rights, uh, though, I mean, we know that it's kind of a domino effect where uh, one violation would lead to a violation of every other right. Still, right. what would you consider the most violated rights uh, in this country as of today? So, uh, I, I will uh, stick to what the statement that you have said, that, yes. you know, all rights in the country have been very severely compromised. Yes. You, you look at the right to health and nutrition. You know, 46% of our children in this country are still malnourished, and yes. it seems it is worse than sub-Saharan Africa. Bangladesh does better than us, Pakistan does better than us on malnutrition. So yes. I, I, I think that we just don't have the capacity to take care of our children who are under five years old. There is infant yes. mortality, which is again very, very grave. We, yes. we, we see even today in the 21st century, there are reports of maternal mortality. 
No, mm. these are the things that can be in fact uh, uh, addressed and uh, in fact overcome because it is, it is no more uh, an issue where uh, it, it, you have to be challenged so badly. So yeah. then afterwards you have uh, a violation of rights for children between 6 and 14. You have child labor, you have child yeah. trafficking, you have child sexual abuse. We are yeah. just discussing that rape. Uh, then for 14 to 18 years, in fact, the government practically doesn't have any sustainable program to see that those children live with dignity. So mm. at every level there is a compromise and all rights are equally important. All rights are mutually uh, dependent. It's, in, it's not fair to prioritize one right over the other or let one right compete with another right. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I will not be able to say which is an important right. To me, all rights are equally important. Yes, ma'am. And uh, you refer to malnutrition and uh, the latest report of uh, Statistics and Program Implementation Ministry has very alarming figures. Uh, and it also mentions that uh, in the most often when it comes to girl children, vaccination cycles fail. The course is never completed. Uh, have you come across, I mean, have, has NCTZ come across uh, such, uh, such a trend? No, no, we have, we have not received complaints about lack of, like, direct complaints, except that I look at literature, mm -hmm. I look at surveys, mm -hmm. and I find that what you say is true. It's mm -hmm. not just girls, I think there is the completion of the entire cycle of immunization has not occurred uh, mm -hmm. in most uh, occasions. And mm. that, that, that is uh, really, uh, uh, I mean, quite shocking. I mean, after we know all the protocols and we mm. know that uh, this is the best way to get the, uh, you know, to get children an immunity from some of the deadly diseases, I yeah. think we will have to just see that it happens. Yes. Uh, in fact, the government has been making a lot of, uh, you know, noises about malnutrition. I think in the last four or five, uh, when, whenever there was a crucial address to the nation or someplace, mm. Uh, even the Prime Minister had prominently mentioned that uh, we would be dealing with yeah. malnutrition. Has something been done after that in something uh, special? I, I, must say, I, I must say that uh, on this issue, if you compare it from like 2005, 6 to now, there has been a huge change. You yeah. know, uh, although th th there is a lot to be done, but still we had hardly some 8 to 9 lakh uh, Anganwadi centers in the country. Now we have 14 lakh Anganwadi centers the yes. largest number of centers anywhere in the world. And yes. then we have also linked it to adolescent girls and nutrition program. We have mm -hmm. linked it to crashes for uh, mothers. We have linked it to compulsory breastfeeding for children up to six. All of this happening through the Supreme Court orders that they have issued. And now there is a restructured ICBS program which was recently approved by the cabinet and hopefully it should have greater investments in early child care. And we, when you compare to a decade ago and now, I think yes. our country has made a lot of strides in terms of institutionalizing services for children below six years of age. So yes. I would uh, not be cynical about it. I would say that there is a lot that has happened, and but that's not enough. Okay, okay. Uh, then my I, I have... Uh, Srikant Kochalakota from Los Angeles, uh, he has a question for you. He would ask a question himself. Uh, Srikant Karu, okay. uh, please go ahead. Shantaji, Namaste Andy. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much for coming uh, on, uh, on air today. I have a question about, yeah, uh, I have a question about entry of this uh, multinational corporations into, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the recent reforms of FDI. So, without proper uh, without proper mechanisms to hold them accountable, uh, which might lead to child labor, uh -huh. is there any directions that were uh -huh. sent from NCPCR to uh, to the government uh, to study uh, the impact of FDI in retail, where our country is uh, having 44 percent of people in poverty, uh, and the impact of uh, FDI in retail on child labor? Thank you. No, no, we have not uh, looked specifically on the investments that are coming and how it would impact children. But certainly we have looked at an amendment to the Child Labor Act, which would cover children even if they are being employed as a consequence of FDI. We are saying that in, uh, all forms of child labor will have to be banned. Currently, as it stands, the Child Labor Act bans children working only in hazardous industries. 
Now yeah. with right to education being a compulsory and free, we have very strongly put forth the argument that no child should be out of school. And if they're out of school, they will perforce join the workforce. So one will have to abolish all forms of child labor. I'm glad to tell you that the cabinet has given an approval to banning all forms of child labor. And when you do that, even children who are working because of FDI, you know, investments will also be banned from working. Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Actually, as an extension of that question, uh, is there a way to engage with corporate uh, sector uh, to, to make them more responsible and more accountable uh, in terms of uh, uh, preventing child labor? Uh, actually, the, uh, again, let me come back to the amendments. Uh, where earlier the Child Labor Act, the offense was not be, um, a, a cognizable offense, yes. you know, and it was a, a bailable offense. Uh, but now with an amendment that will come, it will be a cognizable offense uh, and uh, a non-bailable. So which means it, it, the police can get into action. Yes. And no matter who, it could be the biggest of corporate sectors, the police will have to arrest them if they are found guilty of employing children. And I think that would become a big radical act. At the moment, it is a labor department alone. But once the police gets into it and once it gets criminalized, I think it will act as a big deterrent to the corporate world and the corporate sector. Also, I think these multinationals that come in, they can't have double standards. One set of standards for children in their own countries where they have every child going to school, and that they tolerate child labor in countries like ours, and they don't insist that we maintain labor standards and that children must not work. So I think they also should, should have a greater corporate social responsibility and ethical standards and ensure that in their chain of supplies, no child is working. You know, they have a corporate social responsibility on this issue. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, then, you know, probably, you know, what uh, we have to ask a question that has been, uh, it's rather controversial uh, because by definition, any child out of school is a child worker. <clears throat> but, but realistically speaking, you think it's possible to provide education and good health to a child even as uh, probably, you know, the child is engaged in some form of non-hazardous labor, which is probably happening across India right now. No, no, no. There is no question of asking the question, is it possible? It is a right now. It's a fundamental right. It's yes. a constitutional guarantee. It has to be provided. And yes. it is a responsibility of the state. Under the Act, it says the state shall provide. It's not needed say the parents shall provide for education. Yes. So there is no way in which one can now debate on whether it is possible. It has to be made possible. Okay, okay. And, and it is, I think, possible. Okay, okay, ma'am. And uh, uh, the government has into, introduced various policies and schemes to attract kids to schools and prevent uh, dropouts, uh, the midday meal program, uh, cash vouchers, etc. So, uh, what do you, you think uh, is, has been the most effective scheme so far in implementation? And is, is it for, uh, possible to replicate, you know, make it uh, more local, uh, locally implemented scheme? Any one particular scheme that you would say that has been most uh, effective? Uh, I, I, I would think that the, the, the Right to Education Act has several provisions. Yes. Some of them, I can't say one, but I can say a bunch of uh, three or four which are, I think, becoming very effective. Mm -hmm. One is the uh, uh, formation of school management committees. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a constitutional mandate that every school should have school management committees. Mm -hmm. And they are, in many places I have seen, being trained to monitor how a school functions and in, to do audit of schools mm -hmm. and to see that the schools actually function. And this yes. is being done by illiterate uh, parents and they're doing it extremely well. Mm -hmm. Then another thing is that uh, the whole set of rules that have come, mm -hmm. which says that the child, there should not be school fees, that there shall not be an insistence on birth certificates, that yes. there shall not be an insistence on uh, transfer certificates and documentation, mm -hmm. all this has enabled children to stay in school. 
The other oh. issue is that for backlog of children who have never been to school, there is a mandatory age appropriate uh, uh, training that has to go for children. That's not fully picked up, but I heard that in some places that is also being picked up. So there are several provisions of that. It's so slowly penetrating deeply into the psyche of the department as well as the uh, grassroots level. I think it is a matter of uh, time, uh, two or three years, by which we will see majority of children in school. Okay. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what MB Foundation has been doing? Because uh, they have done a lot of path-breaking work. Uh, so could we know a little more about it uh, from you? See, the, uh, MVM right now is focusing a lot of attention on preparing, as I told you, the school management committees yeah. uh, to see that the Right to Education Act is implemented. And it is also looking at Gram Panchayat, where yeah. every Gram Panchayat has a list of children from 0 to 18, yeah. entire names, and they sit once in a month to track every child to mm -hmm. see if the child has well, is well nourished, is healthy, is going to school, okay. is brought in child labor, and the youth are playing a tremendous role in monitoring uh, how the school management committee mm -hmm. okay. and the okay. panchayats are functioning. Okay. So I think okay. the MEF is institutionalizing the mm -hmm. provisions of RTV Act at the moment. Okay. Uh, oh. Uh, we have uh, Sindhu from Los Angeles. She has a question, ma'am. She'll ask the question. Okay. Uh, hi, Shanta Sinhaji. I have a question. Uh, like you have been working on this child labor for a, a lot of years. So I just wanted to know, uh, as I see, like you no know, nowadays in the middle class, at least middle class families and you no know, upper middle class, they are uh, afraid to engage a child labor. So do you really uh, see, like in statistics, like what is there any decrease in the child labor from uh, say ten years back and now? Uh, did you see, uh, see that trend change or something like that? Um, actually, the statistics show that there is a decrease in child labor. Uh, the, the NSS uh, survey uh, shows there is a decrease, in actually 50% decrease in child labor. But we are still waiting for the census 2011 to tell us the true uh, story on whether there is really a decrease in child labor. They are telling us that there is a decrease in child labor in something called the main sector. Okay. okay. Yeah, but not in marginal sectors. So they improve, there's an increase in informal sectors, increase in domestic child labor. In certain yeah. sectors, there's been an increase, but decrease in certain main, as main workers, in, in hardcore productive work, uh, there are, there's a decrease in child labor. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. My uh, next question is, uh, uh, how has the NCTC have been dealing with the issues of vulnerable children? Uh, for example, recently there have been instances of HIV positive kids uh, getting thrown mm -hmm. out of schools. Uh, there have been many such incidents mm -hmm. even in Hyderabad. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, as, um, as far as my information goes, uh, those kids never went back to school. Uh, they still mm -hmm. continue to be out of school. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, has uh, your intervention made a difference? Uh, uh, of this sort, and uh, whether it's HIV positive kids or uh, minors in prostitution, uh, w yeah. what has been the what has been the effect? See, we have had several public hearings on children affected or infected with HIV and AIDS, and uh, the cases that have come to us, we have followed up about 300 cases uh, to its logical conclusion that children who had access to ART treatment. Sometimes when they were uh, orphaned and they had no, their property rights were taken away by their so-called guardians, they were given legal aid to get it back. Some yes. children did not get admission into schools, they got their admission to school. But then these were only two of the cases whom we have heard. There are some thousands of cases whom we have not heard. And as you say, that the challenges continue to remain the way they are. Uh, and But we've come out with a policy document it's there in our web on a grid of what each state has done for HIV and AIDS and uh, what the limitations are and what has to be done. So yes. that's where I think the Commission has informed the policy on uh, HIV and AIDS. Yes. And children of sex workers 
and uh, traffic children constantly we get uh, complaints and we join hands with the district authorities with the anti-human trafficking units with the NGOs concerned to see that these children are rescued but it is a huge huge problem and continues to be uh, I, I mean uh, a very stubborn problem in the country today. Oh, okay. Uh, we have also heard of uh, uh, that uh, with the, um, a lot of rural urban migration and more and more people leaving the agriculture sector. There has been a kind of a, uh, the revival of the bonded labor trend in the rural areas. Uh, so, have you come across any anything has it come to your notice? Something like no, that. No, no, not that way. I agree with your first part of the statement that there is greater migration of population from urban to rural. Hmm. Not enough work in the agriculture sector because not enough investments happening in the agriculture sector. Therefore, we have this agriculture crisis and farmers crisis also in the country because the investments are there, not enough. But I have not heard of this causing bonded labor in the village uh, and growing bondage, bondage because of this. In fact, oh. there's a growing growth in migrant child labor and mm -hmm. bondedness because of them being migrant. Okay. Child, not because they're in the rural sector, but because they're going to brick kilns to construction work, to quarries, uh, outside the village and they're ah. pushed and that's how they're getting into bondage. Yeah, and hopefully it is still not uh, a big enough uh, trend that to come to your notice. Uh, that is what we hope. Uh, there's uh, one more uh, question. Is you have uh, uh, you talked about children in conflict areas. Uh, uh -huh. Any particular instances that you can tell us, any particular cases where uh, NCPCR has intervened? We have a program which is funded by the Prime Minister's Relief Fund called Bal Bandhu. This okay. is a program in uh, ten states, uh, five states of uh, 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 Bihar, Andhra Pradesh, Assam, Maharashtra, and Chhattisgarh, mm -hmm. where we are mobilizing gram panchayats and the youth and the community to mm -hmm. revive schools and anganwadi centers and mm -hmm. to see that children are protected. It's doing very well there. You know, yes. one, would, uh, one would think that everything has collapsed in these areas. And mm -hmm. in fact, when we did begin, it, there were many of these institutions were dysfunctional. But mm -hmm. now we see there is a lot of change that is occurring uh, because of uh, a dialogue between a community and a government that was facilitated by the commission. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the Pradeep Patipati has a question. He wants to know uh, what uh, what has what action has been taken pertaining to children performing on television? It, because it's a kind of uh, child abuse. And also, uh, it's quite easy to catch, considering that everything is uh, and probably one of the easiest space, uh, sectors where you can take instant action. In spite of that, we still find uh, kids performing sometimes very dangerous stunts, sometimes uh, uh, very indecent or uh, vulgar uh, mm -hmm. acts that they're doing. So uh, what, what has been you? I, I know that you, in CPCR, had intervened uh, in the past, uh, but uh, considering that yeah, they're being... Yeah, yeah. We have intervened, we formed guidelines, the guidelines were uh, adopted by the Broadcasting uh, Corporation in India and then uh, it become part of the rules. Unfortunately, the audience, the viewers, are not giving complaints when they find something which is unacceptable. If there is no complaint, it is so difficult for us to push an action. So, you yeah. know, they, they, what you say is happening. Uh, yeah. But then, uh, and there is a, uh, you know, scroller that goes saying if you have something uh, yes. which you think you should it's complain, yes. Yes. No, yes. No, nobody's complaining. Yes. We are yes. not getting complaints, objects on this. The, they have, it is because of us, all children, they have such uh, very good rules and regulations and the broadcasting corporation is seeking for complaints, but nobody's making complaints. Yes, ma'am. Very hard. Uh, and I, I please ask your friend to give specific complaints to yes. us, and I will take it up. I'm asking people to give us complaints. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the complaint can be directly addressed to you and uh, sent off yes. to the commission in Delhi? Yes, yes, yes. It can be addressed to us also. They have yes. to say which show, at what time it is being shown, 
by which TV channel and then we will take it up from there. Yeah. I have not received a single complaint of, uh, in the last three years. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, do the laws we have, you know, that you have spoken about rules that uh, the Broadcasting Corporation has. So, uh, the Broadcasting Council has. So, regarding rules, what what do you think uh, of the laws right now uh, in, in existence in India? Yes, are they, they, they are there. Uh, yes, no, you are not just uh, pertaining to broadcasting, but uh, beyond broadcasting, that laws pertaining to children and their rights and child labor. You think we have sufficient laws or... Is there a gap somewhere, uh, where, uh, is it, or is it just a problem with enforcement? I think uh, some laws, like the Right to Education Act, and then protection of children from sexual offenses, these are very strong, powerful laws. But uh, but then one and Juvenile Justice Act is a very powerful act. Yes, uh, it's not just enforcement, but it is a lack of public awareness on the existence of these laws. How many of us know that in every district there, uh, there is a child welfare committee, like it happens in the United States, and mm -hmm. that there is a juvenile justice board, and that there is a juvenile justice system, and that if there is any abuse or violence, even by a parent or the child, they can contact the child welfare committee. We don't seem to know about what facilities are available in the system which we can access. So I yes. think there has to be greater public awareness uh, on some of these acts. Yes. Has, has there been some intervention uh, regarding juvenile delinquents and probably both schools? Has there been some intervention at any point from NCPC here? You yes, think there's yes, a need for intervention? If constantly making intervention, constantly get complaints about violence, abuse on children, uh, by the wardens, sometimes older children over the younger children, then we are making inspections, uh, we are uh, insisting that they should all be licensed homes, they cannot be unlicensed homes, we have written to several governments all over the country, and this is one of the issues that the Commission has been taking up in a very systematic fashion uh, in almost every other state, even in the Haryana. In two months back, we had the uh, uh, some three very important raids uh, conducted where there was a, a spate of sexual abuse on children by the management itself and we got them all arrested. So I think this is an issue that uh, we are taking up rather seriously. Uh, okay. Uh, what would you think, I mean, if you have to uh, get it into a nutshell, what, what do you think are the most major challenges uh, before NCPCR uh, at this point of time? teacher has found out is that if you have to talk about children and their rights, we will have to see certain non-negotiables in governance. First of all, it has to be decentralized. Most programs, policies in the country are overtly centralized and that every institution must have a system of... Yes. Uh, what we found out was that we have to do a lot of reforms in governance greater yes. decentralization, greater convergence between departments uh, because you can't have uh, uh, a, a fragment child rights into labor department, health department, education department, but, but it seems that is how it operates, but at least there has to be greater convergence of services um, for all the departments. Then greater child, child participation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as children are older, they must have a say in how uh, what is happening and uh, uh, how one may address uh, yeah. their concerns and their issues and empower them. See, if a girl is getting married, she must feel empowered to say no. Yeah. You know, and not succumb. So we think yeah. child participation is also very, very important. I mean, these are very huge challenges and the flexibility uh, in the way the services are rendered to the local context. So we think if these are done, then only we will be able to reach out to children on any program that is oh. being run. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Shantasena. It has been a real honor and pleasure to have you on our show. Uh, and then right. talking to you is actually pretty inspiring and, you know, it evokes uh, confidence that with you at the helm of FS, uh, we are sure to see a lot more positive changes in the ground situation. So thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, thank uh, you. I'm
I am sure uh, we would be able to initiate uh, some kind of a campaign whenever we see something. We would be able to approach you directly, probably file a complaint or something. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Shan. And Srikanth, bye. Bye.